Okay. All right. Um, so uh, uh, this is the title. It's provisional, but it's Arizona's pro-immigrant struggle from the early 2000s to the present, a key organization. That's what I'm going to focus, but I need to give you a little background. Hmm? Uh, we have among us in the U.S. about 10.5 undocumented uh, workers. It used to be about 12 million. And 5, to 6, 5 to 6 million uh, migrated en masse from Mexico right after the NAFTA agreement was inaugurated in 1994. The other 4.5 uh, to 5 undocumented workers migrated primarily from Central America. A migration path unleashed after the Contra Wars in the 1980s started by Ronald Reagan and a policy to stop Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala from going socialist. Other undocumented immigrants come from Ireland, about 160,000, South America, uh, the Caribbean, uh, Eastern Europe, China, Africa, and other countries. Okay, so when we talk about the uh, 11 million or so on, everybody thinks they're all Mexicans. <laughs> Uh, because of uh, the long historical relationship of migration from the uh, uh, 1848 to the present, but this is the, the, the this is the, the reality. Okay, yeah. what is the thesis? Mexican migration is part of a, a migrant experience traced back centuries, if not thousands of years, but in modern times it is linked to the Mexican-American War of 1848, the subsequent industrialization of the Southwest, economic incursion of the on the part of uh, American imperialist and the late 19th century, actually industrialist, and the Mexican Revolution from 1910 to 1924, which was a movement to repel the US and, and British uh, industrialists who came in to take over Mexico, and, and, and an economic dependence on the part of Mexico from the 1930s to the present. The massive Mexican, uh, um, Na Mexican NAFTA migration wave from the 1994 to the present research a pro-immigration struggle that has its uh, exemplary manifestation in Arizona from the late 2000s to, the, to, to 2010 with the fight against the SB 1070 and several culturally repressive <laughs> laws. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to share is what are the objectives? A brief history of Mexican Mexican migration into the US, United States, the forced opening of a mass migration path through Arizona, and three, the pro-immigrant movement in organizations among Mexican Americans, Native Americans, other US Latinos, progressive whites, and, uh, and Afro-Americans. Yeah. Well, here's, let's look at this. This, if we, we're going to understand Mexican migration, and uh, this is why everybody thinks that people come from the South are all Mexican, because it's been going around for a long time. And I don't think it, it will stop because to an extent uh, the economies are, are linked. Yeah, but a billion dollars of trade is done every day in the Mexico-US Mexico border a day. Mm -hmm. And workers from the, from, the side, from the Mexico side and from the US side depend on survival, uh, on their jobs. Mm -hmm. And so on. Okay. So, but here, here's the. Uh, this is uh, comes from uh, Albert Camarillo. He, he uh, is a historian at Stanford University. He helped establish uh, the National Association for Chicano Chicano Studies, and uh, <clears throat> it was also the uh, uh, the the, term, the the thing about the NAFTA Mexican Migration Wave that was developed by a, a local uh, a person named Juan Villa who works for Univision. And uh, who wrote a who wrote a um, thesis about films and so on, migration films. Yeah, but okay. uh, this are it. And that, but I also found this pattern, this uh, historical, this historical periods, in some other uh, um, sociologist. Uh, one who I can't remember his right, his name right now. He's, but he's he's been a top researcher on immigration. I think from the 1980s to the present. Okay. But this is the first migration wave, 19, well, but other than this is, let's say, from 1848 to uh, right after the war, uh, the U.S. government gave people uh, two a year to decide whether they're going to stay or go back. And, on, and out of the uh, 75,000 to 100,000, only about uh, 2,000 left, and they were encouraged by the Mexican government to settle along the, the northern border, okay? And from the 19, 1848 to uh, 1910, People come and go. I mean, there's no border. The first, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, border patrol 
the first uh, it didn't get established until 1924, which was to push back the first migration wave. That's when it started. Okay, but before that, you could come and go. There's no problem. You, you could you walk in, or you came in a donkey or in a horse. Uh, at that time, there was no railroad. Okay, no buses, no airplanes. So you, people just crossed both ways. Some were runaway slaves, black slaves who, didn't, uh, who went into Mexico. Some were whites who, uh, who were in trouble with the law or they didn't like the U.S. and went into Mexico. So you could cross, which is quite different today. Today, if you want to cross the border, you even have to show your passport now. Hmm? So, I mean, it's quite a, quite a difference. Okay, the first migration wave from 1910 to 1924, it has to, it has to do with the uh, Mexican Revolution, which was uh, an anti-imperialist war to push, to push out the, uh, the capitalists from the U.S. and, and from England. Okay, and uh, because uh, Porfirio Diaz was a dictator, he was just basically, he wanted to develop Mexico, industrialize Mexico and mm -hmm. modernize Mexico. So he was just giving out uh, land uh, and mines and everything, okay? So, I mean, you can go back to the mine here in Cananea around 1906 or so, where uh, even Mexicans there were paid half, as, uh, only half the wages that were paid to uh, American and white workers who were went to work in Cananea, okay? And uh, it was a company town in Cananea who owned it, and some, uh, some capitalists from uh, Arizona, okay? So the first migration wave, there's, uh, there's Mexico only has about 15 million people, about a million people are gonna be killed in, in the wars and about a million migrate. And uh, most of that million migrate into the U.S. And the U.S. was industrializing, it needed, needed it was industrializing, uh, <clears throat> the farms, mining, and, and cattle raising. So it needed workers. So it just coming in, work, okay? And so, uh, but after the war, the, the 19, uh, 1930s depression, is pushing back. It was, uh, was uh, they, they were pushed back. And, and about half a million were deported, and many of those who were deported were children, born in the U.S. And, and, and U.S. citizens, okay? And then what happens is then, okay, <clears throat> they don't want them there, but then comes World War II. And during World War II, uh, e even in World War I, there was an effort to recruit Mexicans to come and work here, okay? Officially on the part of governments. But during World War II, uh, most of the, uh, the youth in the, in, in the U.S. were being sent off to, uh, recruited and sent off to war, including Mexican-American uh, Mexican -American, uh, uh, workers. So that uh, they needed somebody to do the farm labor. And who was it? Let's go to the Mexicans. And they said it officially, okay? I mean, even today, there's this love-hate relationship in terms of uh, uh, Mexican labor, because here's Trump. Uh, he says, okay, uh, the, the meat factories are, have COVID, and, uh, the, you know, he declares it a national emergency right away. They didn't take him long to declare him, and because many of those workers there are Mexican and some are Central American without papers, okay? And are you here in Arizona, if you go to Yuma, Arizona, more than 50% of the workers who work in the fields are without papers or are temporary workers. So they, Trump hates them, but he, he still, he silenced them because they're still available. And even in his own uh, Mar-a-Lago, he, he, he has hired uh, undocumented, okay? But that was the uh, first, great, uh, first great migration. And uh, some mo many uh, organizations, the Mexican, Mexican American community supported them, but there was one that took a position. It was LULAC, I mean, Un League of United uh, Latin American Citizens. They even changed the name. They weren't being known as Mexicans. They changed it to Latin American, so they would not be deported and they emphasized English. And I think they also supported the effort to uh, deport. Uh, here in uh, Arizona, I think Friendly, uh, my understanding from Friendly House, used supported the domestic deportations in the 1930s. Okay, I want to mention to you that, that inside the Mexican community or, or the, uh, or the uh, Latino community, there's anti-immigrants, okay? They're very, and they're there, okay? They're some are Trumpers, just to keep this in mind. Okay, the next period was the, the like I said, the Bracero period, 1942 to 1964. It was a temporary program, and only while the war lasted and, and the youth came back from the war and then they needed jobs, no? No, the farmers uh, needed them, and they kept uh, 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 kept uh, <clears throat> talking to the elected officials, uh, lobbying so they can keep it, and they kept it until 1964. Okay, 
And uh, keep that in mind in 1964, because right after 64, the way that, since you don't have any more workers coming in, control workers, uh, low wages, and uh, 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 very bad living conditions, now you still need Mexican workers, and that's how you establish the maquiladora system all across the border. So now you don't need them to come to the U.S. You just take the factories there. It's still a cheap labor, because even today, in a maquiladora, you only make about anywhere from $8 to $11 a day, not an hour, a day. So, but what happens is, you see how it's from 1942 to 1964, it lasts a long time. It wasn't supposed to do that. But within that, you have the other um, uh, period, the other migration wave, which is the so-called Mojado period. And that one is from the 1940s also, and uh, it has never stopped to an extent, although they made a, an, a great effort to, to uh, get rid of them in the 1950s after the, the war in Korea. And then the soldiers came back, they needed jobs, so they pushed them back. Okay, so what happens here? This is, I wrote this little uh, phrase. No bracero legal permit, then cross the border or barbed wire, wire. So because many of the, the, the to, in order to get braceros, they would uh, send the, uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the the order for more Mexican workers to come and work to the villages, to the cities and so on. And then uh, even the mayors or so would sell them or there would be lotteries so they can come. And what happens, they will all come in mass and mass and to, in order to come, they had to pay their transportation or so and other expenses. And maybe they had to buy the permit from the local mayor or the local po police. And what happened is they came in, but they had to sell a cow, they had to sell, take out loans, they had to, they had to whatever. So they came in in debt. And then when they uh, line them up to come in, they, okay, you're too fat? No. You're missing a finger? No. Uh, you, your hands are very smooth? Oh, you're not a, you're not a worker. You're an intellectual trying to come, come in. So there was many, 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 many rules to exclude some workers. And, but those workers were already at the border around Texas, or, and they, they were in debt, and they couldn't go home. So what they did is they went back to the tradition of just jumping the border. Okay? And uh, and a lot of and the, you go look at the Bracero period. There were there were millions of workers involved during forty two to sixty four, and so in the uh, in the Mojado period, all those workers were also mostly illegal, and they also climbed to the to the millions. Okay, no, and that's that's that uh, it's, it still exists today. But, but today, uh, before, if you wanted to cross the border, you knew a neighbor, or a friend, and he was the friendly coyote. And, who helped you? Now it's the the narco coyote, and they charge you to get in anywhere from five thousand to ten thousand. If you come from another country, maybe fifteen thousand up to fifty to sixty thousand dollars. If you come from China, okay, but that's that's what it says. Okay, but that's the uh, Mojado period. Okay, then comes the second great migration wave. When is that? From nineteen sixty four to nineteen eighty six. And uh, Mexico was having uh, economic problems and death and so on. And a lot of people just started migrating uh, massively. Uh, and uh, that's, it's gonna end in 1986 with the uh, uh, migration reform. The last one we had where 2.5 million people got uh, green cards, okay? And then, uh, but, but from the first migration wave, the second migration and the third migration wave is primarily Mexican, okay? Once again, uh, in the first migration grave, you're coming in by donkey, by you're walking in, maybe a horse. Uh, the railroad is, this, there's some people who come in through railroad and they go all the way to Chicago, okay? Uh, but now what comes with the, and that was period, with the Bracero period also in the so-called Mahalo period to the 60s, is mostly, uh, there was very little uh, transport Transportation. Mexico itself was industrialized and urbanizing, and was modernizing its uh, its transportation system. Okay, but what happens now <laughs> in the 1980s? The, all of a sudden, they're repressing the uh, the Contra wars in Central America, and that a lot of people start fleeing. And some of the people who got to Washington, the state of Washington D.C., uh, they used to be maids and servants of the of the uh, U.S. soldiers fighting the war over there. And after the war, they sponsor them so they can come in. Okay, but still, you have a mass migration from from uh, uh, Guatemala, from El Salvador, and from and, and some from Nicaragua. Okay, and so uh, so no no no, and also what happened in Mexico is in Mexico now you have uh, better roads, you got airplanes, you got some railroads, so that it's easier to move 
because and migration and the first two waves of migration from Mexico was primarily from northern states, from Michoacán, Jalisco, Zacatecas, uh, este, um, uh, Sonora. Este, those, that's where they came because they were very close to the border. But now, since Mexico has a, 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 a modernized uh, um, transportation system, people can come from anywhere and they can get from Yucatan or uh, they can get from Central America. If they, if they in a plane, they can do it uh, uh, in one in a few hours or they, they do it by bus two or three days or they can do it by train. So it's easier, it's easier, much easier to come. And also if you come to the Northern border because you have my, my Queladora system, it's easier to get a job because wages are higher. In, 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 in the north in the northern border from uh, from uh, uh, <clears throat> from uh, from uh, Matamoros all the way to Baja California okay the wages are lower from south of Mexico City okay so it's an attraction just to move north and also to come across okay so that's what happened and that's when the 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 massive uh, migration and the uh, second great migration wave it was not only Mexicans but Central Americans and that is it's said today. Okay, when you have if you were to have another massive migration wave in the future, let's say five ten years from now, you would have Central Americans too. Okay, it just just how it is because it's easier to get through. Okay, and then comes the. Uh, uh, NAFTA Mexican migration wave from 1994 to today. And it was all agreed because what happened is that uh, the US, they say, well, we cannot solve it by giving them amnesty and we cannot solve it by putting the, the maquiladora system. What we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, uh, um, uh, integrate more the economies of Mexico and, and the US. What you do is not only do you allow us to put factories inside along the border, La Maquiladoras, but you allow us to establish uh, uh, <clears throat> factories, maquiladoras, anywhere in Mexico, including uh, Yucatan, uh, Chiapas, all over the place. I, I have visited this place and I've seen th those things. Okay. And the other thing, of course, you let us have, you do not subsidize your farmers and you allow us to supply food for Mexico including corn. Mexico, the corn grew in the Valley of Mexico for thousands of years, okay? It was domesticated there. And the U.S. is no longer tomatoes. Uh, everything came from the U.S., okay? And, and then the, the U.S. knew that that would cause a migration wave because a lot of people in the countryside would lose their jobs and they would migrate to Mexico. And the solution was, oh, we will have a similar immigration reform like in 1986 and we'll give them amnesty and they can stay except 9-11 uh, happened and all the anti-immigrants uh, got it right in the front and says no more, no more and they're terrorists and blah, 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 and stopped them. And Trump is the uh, uh, major manifestation of that, okay? But those are the uh, Im immigration uh, the Im immigration waves, okay? And, and once again, the uh, Mexico, I think is the 15th economy in the world. And so the US is number one, so there's dependency. And uh, like I said, it's a billion dollars a day in trade between uh, Mexico and the US. So, and a lot of people depend on the jobs on this side and that side, okay? So let me now go to uh, the pro-immigrant struggle in the Mexican-American community from the 1960s to the present. And Bert Corona and his followers, Bert Corona is, uh, <clears throat> he was a, uh, an immigrant, his parents came after the Mexican Revolution. He belongs to the first migration wave. His father was a villista in the revolution because many of the people who came here from the, in the 1910 to 1924 were villistas and were, were zapatistas were in, in the revolution, okay? There, you also had some conservatives come in from the top people come to, uh, the, this is where they came in. And some of the, the one of, I can remember one of conservative uh, uh, has a street name after him in, in El Paso. Okay, but most of the people uh, were uh, uh, were uh, uh, um, involved in revolutionary movements, whether peasant movements or or, uh, or labor movements. And who is Bert Corona? Bert Corona was also um, he, he was on the longshoreman, and he was um, basically a socialist, not a communist. And he started <clears throat> a movement. He said, "We don't want the same the reportations occurring in the 50s nor the 30s. We have to start organizing now." 
Okay, and that was I, I met, first met him in 1969 at the Denver Youth Conference, and then later on I went to my university and got him a speech a speaking engagement. And says, "How much does he want? Now he wants a thousand dollars." That's today like me going to campus saying, "Oh, he wants ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars," and <clears throat> and I was able to get him this money. So I follow uh, his movement. I'm very familiar. He used to organize uh, groups all across the Southwest called CASA. Uh, it has to do with organizing the undocumented and all across the Southwest and LA and California, Texas, Arizona, Chicago, all over the place. And he was he's going to create organizers out of that. Okay. And then inside Casa, eventually was a debate amongst Marxists and I'm a Maoist, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a socialist, I'm, I'm this different groups for different tendencies. Okay. But he created a, 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 a group of people uh, uh, who, uh, uh, some have died recently. Uh, <clears throat> Salvador Reza is, is a product of that. To an extent, I'm a product of, of that of, 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 because I, I helped as much as possible. Although in 19, 1986, I left California, I went to the state of Washington. Okay, here's the uh, <clears throat> one thing that happened also here in the uh, this NAFTA migration wave is that the prior migration to that is that <clears throat> Mexicans migrated through, they followed the railroad, whether they went to Mexicali, which is south of uh, Calexico, or they went to Texas. That's how they migrated primarily, okay? Uh, but, and then what happened is that uh, in order to stop the flow, uh, US policy started building fences and putting more border agents across so they wouldn't, so wouldn't come in, okay? And basically, they left and Clinton left. He says, okay, we're gonna close all the borders except Arizona. And we will not close the Arizona border because that's a uh, natural fence because of the heat of the deserts. They're not gonna cross there, they'll die, okay? Uh, but what happened is that's where they started crossing. And I used to follow those articles in the Arizona Republic and eventually I found one where one writer said, hey, hey, there's been my is this a, uh, the Arizona, uh, Sonora, the desert. This has been a migration route for thousands of years. Okay, because migration in, in the uh, from uh, the north, uh, the uh, the continent from the north to the south has always been through the valleys and the flatlands or in the mountains. It never was through the seas. Okay, the Aztecs were came from the southwest and went into Mexico and so on and many other other nations. Uh, indigenous nations. So therefore, uh, they thought it was safe. But what happened is, is that uh, there was an economic crisis in Mexico. The peso was being devalued and everything. And then NAFTA came in and says, you're gonna give us your agriculture. You're gonna let us uh, throw in McDonald's or Pizza Hut or whatever we want. Uh, uh, it's the Walmarts all over Mexico, okay? And your agriculture. So at least a migration, okay? Right through the desert. Okay, and okay, so therefore, I would say, this is a rough figure, that you, you, have, the, you have those uh, <clears throat> 10.5 million people undocumented. I'm, I'm going to venture to say that about 4 million people passed through Arizona. They didn't stay here, they just passed through here. Went to LA, went to Texas, and then many left to Chicago, because of Proposition 187, I don't, I'm not sure if you remember that one, it rep and California was passed uh, to uh, deny uh, basic help uh, to uh, migrants, okay? And so what they did is then they, uh, the migrants now without papers left to the Midwest and to the South because whereas over here, they were uh, repressing them. And I was in Chicago at that time around 1992. They used to put out leaflets, say, welcome, come on in, don't worry, we'll give you jobs, okay? Because when I was there, the, pop, the, the Latino population was about 600,000 and half Puerto Ricans and four, uh, half Mexicans. And then right now today, it's over a million people. And in New York, you have about, you have about 400,000 Mexicans, half a million, and mostly come from Puebla, which is south of uh, Mexico City. And then some workers went to the south. Uh, in Alabama, all those places, okay? Because they were being repressed in the Southwest, okay? So what happens there is then uh, inside, because here in Arizona, we see the migration flow, and uh, the, the, first the undocumented 
workers in Arizona, the highest they ever got was about 400, 450,000, and right now it's about 200,000 or so, because many left, some left to, back to Mexico. Okay, here's the organizations here. Tona Tierra, led by Salvador Reza. Tona Tierra uh, is a group of activists who used to work, support Cesar Chavez, uh, the struggle. But after Chavez died, they uh, form as a collective. They're basically in indigenous. Uh, and then, of course, Salvador Reza came in to work them. Uh, Salvador Reza used to work with Ber Corona. And then, so they got a struggle here supporting the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, immigrants. Uh, the Jornalero Center, they established it up north where you can get a job. It's still open, still working. The Pruitt's boycott also. And then the Taqueros organization, all the people used to sell uh, food in the trucks or so, uh, he helped them. They're still organized, okay? And today they have Los Comites del Barrio. And those were established after, the, after uh, 2010. And that's to help the, the undocumented deal with uh, <clears throat> jobs, uh, uh, lawyers, and being a victim out of the house and all types of struggles, okay? And then of course in Tucson, and in fact, uh, Salvador, I used to work with him around 2001 or so, and we were already starting a boycott against Arizona way before 2010, okay? And so we used to have problems of what's the name of it and because there was an organization in uh, Tucson and they had the exact name and we had debates, eventually it crumbled. Okay, but meanwhile, what, uh, what happens here in, in Arizona from uh, say 2008 forward, uh, 2006, the Bermudez group rises. And the Bermudez group was, uh, the, he's, a, he's a fundamentalist, a, a, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, those who um, preacher or so. He used to be a Democrat, but he got caught in some type of uh, corruption and then he was put in jail. So he became a Republican. But still, he organized a movement here, pro, pro immigrant, and very effective. Uh, and then, of course, there's a Somos America group. And both of these groups sponsored the first demonstration, pro, uh, pro immigrant demonstration, anti, anti uh, uh, Joe Arpaio. And they brought in, uh, I think in 2008 or so, 20,000 people in the streets. Okay? I didn't go to that when I was doing something else. But later on, uh, Somos America we, becomes a, group, a coalition of about 30, 30 organizations, they, uh, uh, both mainstream uh, Ch Chicano organizations, Mexican American organizations, and also activists of all types. And then we put in the streets, and I was involved in that, 250,000 people. Okay? All right. So who's involved here? The Sonic Hispanic Community Forum. They, they, they got the use of the term Hispanic, but they're all activists from the Chicano movement in the 60s. The Mary, Mary Rose uh, Wilcox contribution, okay, she fought against uh, Arpaio. The Alfredo Gutierrez contribution, he has a book on, on, uh, about how in the 1930s some of his relatives were deported. There's also a novel about uh, some other, uh, I can't remember the name of the author, about the, their family members being deported to uh, Sinaloa, okay? And then, of course, with Somos America, and there was a fight between the Bermudez group and the Somos America. And uh, I think mostly because uh, he was a Republican and many, many of the people involved in South America were Democrats or socialists or whatever. And so they basically eventually he was excluded from the group. Uh, but, uh, but also across the US, everybody started supporting because the pro-immigrant movement and the Mexican American community, and I'm talking about since the 60s to the forward, is a national movement all the time. It's active all the time. It, it, for us, it's normal that, uh, in certain historical periods, when the economy crashes, there's going to be deportations. So we have to get organized and do what we can, okay? So at that time, there was solidarity across the, from LA, from Chicago, uh, from, uh, from everywhere, from Texas. I was sent to, uh, representing Somos America, I was sent to a conference in, in Chicago with all the activists from across the, across the country. Yeah. I had a, a, an email at the time, and I lost thousands of emails because somebody hacked me, okay? I uh, lost a lot, of, a lot of information. Okay, so there's the, uh, the Los Comités del Barrio I mentioned to you, Salvador Reza and my, I myself are followers of Ver uh, Corona, okay? And then Puente, Puente comes out of Somos America. It used to be part of it, but then uh, there was conflicts in there with, you know, after the struggle with subsidizing after uh, uh, 1070. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, Carlos, uh, he used to, he uh, was an undocumented, his family was undocumented. He's now a member of the Phoenix, Phoenix City Council. 
And he has his own center called Puente. And there were people in the in the Chicano community, uh, organized community, who helped him uh, get that center because that center is in the hundreds of thousands just to keep it open every year. Per year. Okay. And then uh, there was direct action against uh, Trump's candidacy. Uh, up there where uh, uh, Arpaio lives, and they blocked the streets, so on. And then there's current direct actions. What are the current actions from uh, April, April to the present? They've been demonstrating outside Florence and jails and the streets. Although they started doing it before the right wings went, went, started doing it and the capitals where they wanted to open the economy. Uh, Puente was already doing this. Uh, people go and they stay inside the cars, they, they protect themselves, but they're doing that. They also have uh, 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 food distribution campaigns. They also uh, have a diaper distribution, they have loans and so on. Many, they try to help as much as possible. It's, it's, it's linked there. And here's the uh, Ray Maldonado group. He's a lawyer, he's a lawyer, and his wife, uh, and he's, uh, he, he, has, he has a contest, I think they give about $1,000 a week right now to uh, undocumented workers who don't have jobs because, and so does Puente, they're helping people who don't qualify for any federal aid, okay? It's basically a collective for survival, okay? And of course, other organizations here is the uh, Dreamers. The Dreamers, uh, they, they've been uh, organized for a long time because remember Proposition 300, and then Arizona denied them uh, in-state in, uh, in, uh, in tuition, okay? And uh, so uh, the, the Chicano Latino community helped organize, uh, at least the first time we raised about a million dollars or so, maybe more, to help pay their tuitions at ASU. There's a student organization, ASU, but besides that, uh, they uh, were able to get DACA and Napa. How did they get uh, DACA? Well, the Chicano community, the Latino community, the pro-American community uh, under saw that that, uh, that Obama was becoming the deporter in chief. Okay, so what did the Dreamers do? Because that's when the, the, the movement came out, undocumented and afraid. They started taking office, taking over the offices of Obama, the re-election campaign. Okay. So you know they didn't get that. Uh, Obama wasn't like a good guy. And well, here's DACA. No, no, it was the Dreamers and the community who pushed them to do that. He also tried to do it with NAFTA, but the Republicans stopped. Stopped. Okay. So and I would say here that the Dreamers were the ones key in uh, opposing uh, Ed Pastor, so he wouldn't run because they felt that Ed Pastor was not a, an outright advocate for them. It was more like the new guy. Yeah, I can't remember his name. Uh, he's the representative. He took over Pastor's position. Okay. And of course, uh, there's one more thing. Uh, uh, yeah. You want to say something what DACA is? DACA, yeah. Deferred, action, deferred uh, uh, action for Childhood Arrival. Correct. Yeah. What, well, what the acronym stands for and what it means to be right. a dreamer. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, the dream has been around for uh, quite a while, they're basically the uh, children of the uh, NAFTA, Mexican immigration wave, okay? Their parents needed to survive. There was no jobs in Mexico. The, the, the peso was being developed. They came in uh, a la brava, illegally, and then they brought their children. And then uh, their children were educated here. And uh, then they, all of a sudden, they go to high school education and they wanna go to the army, they wanna go to college and all of this, that. And they said, then they, they, their parents finally tell them, Sorry, you're not a citizen. But inside the uh, US Senate, there was a, 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 a two senators, a Republican and a Democrat who started the uh, Dreamer Act. And they pushed it for a long time, but they never got it passed. And eventually uh, Obama uh, put in place DACA. And DACA is if you under 30 years old or you migrate a certain time, then you can qualify and you will get you will you will get a temporary order not to be deported and you will get a temporary uh, <clears throat> uh, social security so you can work. Okay, uh, keep in mind that the other people undocumented workers they can get a pin number so they can work. They still file taxes. Okay, but this is the the, the DACA people. And one famous undocumented worker I can't remember his name. He came in without papers and eventually he he, became, he joined the space program. <laughs> okay, so there's, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's always this, uh, uh, that you can't stereotype the, the migrants. Okay, but let me go to no more debts. No more debts is basically uh, Anglo-American students uh, or people and they uh, uh, distribute water 
and they, and they uh, help people as much as possible. Okay, they were sued a while back. They were repressed. Okay, uh, we need to defend them. And then uh, I, I mentioned the, the Ray Maldonado group and the Maya Chapin group. The last one, they're all uh, Guatemalans, and uh, they're uh, fundamentalists, connected fundamentalist uh, Christians. But uh, I, I work with uh, mm, mm, este, Antonio Velasquez. I've been working with him since around 2008. And uh, right now they're working and trying to get be, be able to use the uh, uh, Phoenix Parks so they can play soccer. Uh, there's soccer leagues involving about 25,000 youth. But besides that, Maya Chapin, Antonio, uh, he came in uh, from Guatemala, and when the Coyote was trying to cross him, he wanted more money, so he took out a gun and shot him in the stomach or stabbed him. And then he still came to Arizona. Uh, way, way at the beginning, there was no. Guatemalan consulate, so he used to go pick up the bodies of dead Guatemalans, and he would help transport them back to where they, uh, to their villages. Okay, so uh, he's also linked to all the Guatemalans across across the U.S. I've been working with them since, since then, and so <clears throat> and one time the the Christ, the this, uh, Christian fundamentalist had a demonstration outside the the Capitol, and I helped them with that too. It, it was against your Payo. And so, okay, let me just conclude. Uh, Mexican migration to the U.S. is part of a mass world migration that began, that began in the 1910s in Europe, all over the world, okay? It, has a, it probably is linked to uh, industrialization of the world. It has a particular relation to the U.S. due to its economic dependency, but Mexican, Mexican uh, in, migrants have traveled across the world. Since the massive deportation in the 1930s, Mexican Americans have always had pro immigrant movements and organizations. Bird Corona is the historical model. Casa and other organizations, okay. Arizona was forced into becoming the main migration path under the historic conditions of the NAFTA Mexican immigration wave. Arizona's organizations, not only Mexican American, but across all nationalities and community groups, rose to the occasion in fighting uh, SB 1070. And they're still fighting to defend migrants, uh, undocumented migrants. Here's some further reading. There's two books. Uh, I have them in PDFs I can send you, and they're all about uh, 1070. And one, one written by uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa Magaña, who's a professor here at ASU. One written, they're both ontologies, one, one by a, a, a professor from UCLA. And then uh, I have a pamphlet by, uh, written by No More Deaths. And then uh, there's two documentaries, uh, Crossing Arizona which is a pro-migrant, and there's Border Wars. Border Wars is the right-wing uh, uh, documentary that you should also see. And there's many, many other movies. There's one uh, put out by PBS about all, all the struggle against 1070 in, in California, and, there's, and then Arizona, and there's footage uh, of uh, the different struggles that were carried across here. The, the people who supported it, it's, it's, it's the strike sound, and the, uh, the, I can remember the name of the fundamentalist Christian group who came in, and all the arrest, and then right in the cover of that uh, video, you have Carlos Garcia. So, but there's many, many. And as far as dreamers, there's uh, Ulisa Arce, who was a dreamer, and then somehow wound up at uh, and, uh, and uh, be working for Salman Sack, Salman, yeah, Salman, the big corporation. But eventually, he, he, she was earning thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. She didn't like it. She gave it up and she funded, established a foundation to help uh, dreamers go to school. And she lives in uh, Tucson. Anyway, that's, uh, I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to do, uh, uh, do uh, 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 graphics, but I can do them later. There's a book on Bird Corona and there's a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, memes on what, what, uh, what uh, Puente is doing. Question.